Okay, so tonight we have Carl Motz, and I will tell you that Carl has been on our, our speaker night list for at least five years, I'm sure. So I've probably reached out to him before, and we just never connected. And I'm really glad we've done that. Uh, finally, to have you here uh, to share with his, his rather outstanding book. Um, it's a preeminent book on traveling photographers. So I'm hoping you can share with us what is a traveling photographer. You're on. That's a question. <laughs> well, actually, I did give a talk to the group of, uh, five years ago. I think it was the history of stuff. I must have missed it. <laughs> but I guess it was Okay. We may need a backup. We're improvising this. Yeah, we can't see over there. Oh. <clears throat> can you hear me? Hello. There, now. Hello. All right. Well, he didn't know that. No, he didn't know he was So the subject, the topic that we're going to talk about is traveling photographers. We will address that question. What are, what are traveling photographers? But uh, there are a number of categories. But before I turn to that topic, let me start with basic terminology related to antique photography. So we get some of the some of the names all figured out here. First of all, photography evolved along two lines: one originating in France and the other in England. It was 1839, it was actually January 1839, that the world was first notified that images captured by a camera could be fixed onto a surface. The primary actor in France was Louis John Mande Daguerre, a painter and showman. His invention was a one of a kind image on a highly polished silver plated sheet of copper. The format of photography has ever this format of photography has ever since been known as the daguerreotype. And I have a, a nice uh, image, uh, example of it in my glass case back here, which you can all look at later. Um, <coughs> the person in England who developed an analogous process was a wealthy gentleman named Henry Fox Talbot, who was a member of the Royal Astronomical Society and a member of Parliament. By 1839, Fox Talbot managed to capture negative images on salt paper, and prints made from these uh, negatives are called talotypes tal or calotypes. <coughs> I don't have any examples of that style of photography. They're pretty, pretty scarce. And unfortunately, I, went, I made my living the last number of years was by buying and selling photographs, so I sold them all. <laughs> but I do publish books as well, and uh, let's see, I guess I forgot how to use the damn thing. Oh, hold on, I got it, I got it. So that's a book that I published on American uh, teletypes, or teletypes. And it's the only book on um, this process that was done in, by Americans, usually really wealthy Americans that were traveling in the Middle East and Europe. So that's about one thing I had to show about tablet touch. <clears throat> so over here on the uh, other side is what is called a half plate tintype, a butcher's wagon, about 1865. <coughs> so, Sharon. Sure. So this is actually the daguerreotype that I brought. It's called a quarter plate, I mean a half plate. Very beautiful thing you can, as I say, look at it in the case it's behind me. It's about 1855. There's no major mark or subject identification, but it is a lovely family portrait. So, technical advances with respect to photographs on glass led to the invention of glass negatives, which made much sharper prints than those made from paper negatives. 
The formats that were most popular after this innovation were the carte de visite and the cabinet card.
Um, the photograph, this story review, was made by a guy named Martin Mason Hazeltine, who, was one, who once had a studio in Nevada City, which I'll talk more about a little later. By the way, if anybody has any questions, ask away. Um, what do I mean by traveling photographers? That was Dan's initial question. Uh, portrait photography requires a relatively stable space within which to practice the craft and business of photography, particularly in the era when painstaking efforts were required to develop and finish each photograph. This requirement is differentiated from the capturing features of light and action, such as with the stereo and the postcard photography. So the traveling, this, uh, so this gives you an example of traveling. Uh, yeah. Okay, this is a very famous uh, traveling photographer's wagon, but it's, he's actually not a portrait photographer. This is Carlton Watson's wagon. Carlton Watson's was probably is probably uh, figures to be the most. He's not known for his business success, but his. Um, his photographic output was prodigious and is now recognized as the most refined and artistically successful output uh, among the many great 19th century photographers, uh, such as Edward Mybridge, William Henry Jackson, Charles Savage, Josie O'Sullivan, F.J. Haynes, and so forth. He had a photo wagon which he used extensively at times to travel to Yosemite to make his magnificent mammoth plates and as far away as Portland, Oregon to record the magnificence of the Columbia River. He traveled all, all over the West to capture landscapes and life in the 19th century. But we're talking more about, in traveling photographers in this context, are, are photographers who want to make a business out of taking portraits of people. So in the early days, nearly everybody was a traveling photographer. Um, a few, I guess, could afford to have a studio in, in a town, but most of them had to get out there and find customers. So that's uh, what we call, what I call, traveling photographers. And here we have, uh, this is, right here is a little newspaper ad. This is M.M. Hazeltine's son, L.S., or Leland Stanford Hazeltine. He had studios in Montana, Idaho, and Mendocino. And um, so he advertised in a lot of papers. We found a few of them. So this down here is just a magnificent example of a traveling photo wagon. And there's no indication as to who this guy is or where it was at. But it's a beautiful example. And actually, I brought it. It's back in the case here. You can look at it. Um, so, there are very few examples of uh, traveling photographer wagons from the Guerrero area, but uh, one is shown here. It's William Shoes. Uh, he called it the Guerrero Saloon. So he could hatch up his horses to the Guerrero Saloon, ride out to. Such a place and, and get customers in there and take their daguerreotypes. So it's in the 1956. As you can see, the Alta California newspaper is right nearby there. There it is. So this next image is a 5x7 tin type. It doesn't quite fit into the neat uh, case. Uh, half plate, full plate, it's designation. But as a photographer's traveling way, it's in terrible, it's in terrible condition. I bought it back in the 18, 1970s from a dealer in San Jose. And uh, the trees suggest it was northwest because it had tall concert trees here. And I actually went to the trouble of uh, cleaning it up digitally just so I could see what it looked like. Uh, restored. Thank you, here. Good. Yeah, that's it, restored, okay. Oh, 
Okay, this next uh, image, this was found by a dealer up in Portland who I've known for decades. Well, I'm from Portland, that's why I know him. But anyway, uh, I got lucky enough to tap into this and put it on eBay, and I got in touch directly with him. It's a fabulous artifact. So this is a this gives you an example of a tent foot uh, studio. So it's got two photographers here, Simmons and Harnish, and they're uh, labeled as artists. There's no address, so it's not like they're not like advertising a uh, studio. And uh, one of them did right on the back, Lafayette, Oregon, July 2nd, 1889. Well, Lafayette, if you know anything about Oregon, Lafayette was one of the original towns in Oregon. It was incorporated in the like, 1830s. And the July 2nd one suggests that they're there for July 4th celebrations. You know, buying customers. So here you have, this is the, uh, See up here the skylight with the light in, and here too. And then over here you have examples of the photographs. Up here is a sign that says uh, uh, four dozen cabinets, a dozen cabinets for 50 cents. I think. Anyway, it's just an amazing uh, cabinet card that just provides all kinds of information for my purposes. Would 50 cents have been very expensive? What would 50 cents have been? 50 bucks. Got me. Still more in reach than how much pressure is. How about Hank, you know how much 50 cents would have been? No. Okay. Hank doesn't know, but nobody knows. <laughs> so the next slide, I just have this in here because I love this. Kirk uh, of a Z. It's a CDB of James Crawford that it shows. Jane G. Crawford. Oops. So this is a guy's painting the sign for James G. Crawford, who was a prolific 19th century photographer in Oregon. For a short time later in the 90s, he was a partner with Clinton Harnish, who was a partner of Alan Simmons in the photo tent cabin car we just looked at. Sign painter is unidentified. It could be James Crawford, or it could be his brother Orwell, or it could be Harnish, or it could be uh, Simmons. Anyways, kind of what I collect for these cart diseases. Okay, the next uh, slide, which we're going to turn to. Any questions? No? Okay. So, here we go. We get to. Martin Mason Hazeltine. So he was uh, actually an incredible photographer. And he worked in Yosemite for many years in the 1860s, so competing with Carlton Watkins and people like that. He was a really good photographer. And in those days, business sense was a little different. So uh, Hazeltine would sell his negatives to Eastern and San Francisco publishers who would publish them, but they wouldn't give him credit. But he didn't care because this wasn't the practice back then. And so uh, there's a lot of, which I'll show you soon, well, I'll just go down here fast. Those are all by, uh, published by John Soule in Boston. And they're all from natives that uh, Hazeltine took. They're beautiful, beautiful uh, images. Um, Okay, so the stereo view. You have a question. What's that? Oh, question. Um, who would be the customers? Who, who would be the customers for these uh, card in the in the catalog? Were they like a, a like a postcard on their day? Uh, well, the customers would be uh, the sitters. They would take have their photograph taken for their family or their friends. Like in, during the Civil War, it became very uh, widespread to get your uh, card visite taken. During the Civil War, it became just exploded in popularity. And they would make uh, Victorian albums, leather albums, and they'd have little slots, and you put your friends in there, you put Lincoln in there, and maybe Tom Thumb, and 
and uh, your relatives, maybe Tester, mm -hmm. when he became famous for dying. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was actually famous before that. But, um, so, that, so generally that's, the idea of the crowd photographer is, is the portrait photographer went out into the field to find customers. And um, Hazel Time had a big family and he drove them around. You know, he was an itinerant uh, photographer and he drove all over the place in Northern California and Oregon and Washington and Idaho, Montana, but mostly in Northern California and Oregon. And uh, he um, did a lot of work. And his, his, his brother, George Irby Hazeltine, was nine years younger. And uh, he's, I'll show you. This is an amazing part of the CDB. But you know, it's not a CDB per se, it's actually a photograph of a photograph. So this is the uh, part of a case image, probably the amber type. But it's got a protector around it. It keeps the glass off the uh, the uh, photo itself, and the guy. Uh, so Hazeltine has pinned it on the board. See, that's a screw, and it's pinned against the board. And then they took a photograph of it. They turned it into a photograph. Was, was, was it more typical for heart disease in the West to have scenery with them because the West was new? The East Coast. Well, that's a, that's an outdoor uh, that's a cased image. It's probably a, it's a, probably an ambrotype. It could be a daguerreotype. It's probably an ambrotype. Oh, right. Yeah, they didn't do much outdoor work. But they're very rare. But the carpet is used for mostly portraits. Yeah, carpet is was taken indoors. But, so when your photography started outdoors. Uh, well, it went outdoors right. in the beginning. Yeah. Like uh, George Johnson took daguerreotypes. As yeah, said Robert Vance up in the old country <clears throat> around here. There's an amazing here type at the uh, Cyril's Library of the uh, of a scene of North San Juan, which uh, used to hang on a nail in the hallway there. Right, Pat? That's how you told me to take it down. I did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was too tempting to see it hanging there, indeed. <laughs> that was many years ago, and I think it's seven or fifteen hundred dollars then. Yeah, it's worth a lot more right now. So this is stereo view, as you can see. And this is uh, um, of uh, Sierra Buttes. So Hazeltine had a studio in Sierra Buttes, um, in the Sierra Buttes mine. And I have a friend who owns property on, this, on Sierra Buttes. This may be on her property. But I don't know how we figured that out, but it's probably the oldest photograph of that area. Um, Hazeltine did uh, have, he had two addresses he advertised during 1865, one in Ubet and one in Nevada City. Now I haven't found any photographs with uh, Hazeltine's imprint indicating these locations, but I did do have the one on Sierra Butte, Sierra Butte's mine which you can see right there. All right. And that's a, it's a portrait. This is an ordinary portrait. Okay, now this is a, this is a really, to me, a very interesting photograph. <laughs> so, and let me get my plate out here. Do this, a shuffle of paper. So I don't know how many of you know where Brownsville is. It's on the road between Marysville and the port. And it was an old bull rush town and uh, many other things back in the day. It's also where my, I had a law office there for 10 years. And I can tell you that this, you, these buildings are still there. One was a restaurant called Lottie Brennan's and the other one was a bed and breakfast that my friend Nancy Alt ran and across the street was a antique store that Rex Mosley, a friend of mine, owned. Well, anyway, 18, whoop. in 1874, John Muir, who uh, had a lady he liked, who lived in Brownsville, he went to visit her. And there was a big storm there, and he, 
being a being an interesting character, he decided to climb a tree and uh, watch the storm from the tree. <laughs> so anyway, um, that is we think John Muir right there in his frock coat. Hmm. And and the guys over here are planting chestnut trees. So the chestnut grove was planted right there. And the chestnut trees are still there. So this was an eight by ten albumin print on a period mount with Hildine's paper label on the back. Fabulous thing. But uh, anyway, I bought it and then I sold it. So but I kept the skin. Beautiful thing. So, this is not very sharp. It's a photograph from a distance of a wagon, and we think it's a Hazeltine's wagon. And anyway, these are stereo halves. What they did back in those days is the photographer would use the, cut the stereos in half and make a presentation album to show what they did, what they had, and double their, their mileage with uh, getting two photographs out of one. So anyway, they didn't do that a lot, but, uh, whoops, where'd it go? There it is. So these are from, the, from Oregon, the Crooked River in Eastern Oregon, and uh, we think those are both by Hazel Time. Okay, now going back to this, these, these are the stereo views that uh, Hazeltine made of Yosemite. And they're very, very popular. And uh, they sold well. There were a number of publishers that published them. Later he did his own stereo views. And uh, they're, they're, they're kind of, they're very nice. But anyway, this was a big deal back then. And later he lived in, uh, in um, Mendocino, and he published a lot of uh, stereo views of the Mendocino logging operations in Little River, Big River, that whole area around Mendocino. And uh, Sule and Boston published them. So I used to find them for my friend uh, Glenn Mason, who grew up in Mendocino and went to Arcata. And uh, he collects them, so I used to sell them to him. Okay. Now these are all samples of what we call imprint. So the photographer's imprint is basically his logo, his way of advertising who he is and where he's at, and so on and so forth. So we've got different. Uh, so you got the photograph boat. You got Thomas's photograph car, photographic car, wandering artist. Lightness car, mammoth car, tent gallery. What's a ferrotype? Ferrotype is a tintype. Fro is you know, iron. So tintype is Latin iron. Uh, so that, that, along with the daguerreotype, the ambrotype on glass, the ferrotype or tintype on flatten iron. So this next uh, <clears throat> cabinet card is really interesting. We want to see it, I guess, because um, it really tells you what you look for to figure out if it's a traveling photographer. So the first thing you notice is that there is no imprint. There's no so whoever is taking this photograph wasn't really that interested in advertising for more business. He just wanted to get the job done and get paid and move on. So there's no imprint which suggests an itinerant photograph, photographer. Um, in addition, the setting of the scene appears to be makeshift, even extremely so. The marginal technical aspects such as overexposure, backdrop, clutter, uh, and so forth suggest an inexperienced photographer lacking the tools of an accomplished photographer, which you find in, in town, in the city. The plank floor suggests an outbuilding, 
rather than a finished studio. The good news is that this group was fortunate to have a traveling photographer visiting their locality to capture a close-knit family portrait of what appears to be a rural family, perhaps without a father or prominent male figure. So I think this is a really, I mean, this isn't something that the market would recognize, per se, but I love it. I think it's a great example of, of uh, the history of the traveling photographers. And here's another one. This is, um, so this guy is, uh, I know as Will Foley at, where is he at? Anyway, it's in Mississippi. Yeah, you go, Nashville, Mississippi, which I'd never heard of. But he's obviously, this is called an occupational. It shows a subject with his tools. So I looked up Nashville, uh, Mississippi, and the place uh, was never incorporated. It's a ghost town now. It's located at a, at a low point on the east bank of the Tom Big B River close to the Alabama border. It was devastated by floods in 1847 and 1850. It was a minor shipping port until the Civil War. The National Ferry continued to operate until between 1867 and 1873. This occupational cabinet card of a blacksmith dates to around the time the ferry stopped running. So it was Okay, these next two cabinet cards, whoops, got to see them So they're both um, unidentified, and they're, there's, no, there's no imprint, so the starver didn't care to advertise, so he, he just got doing his job, finds a customer, and saying, yeah, take a picture of my dirty part. They're both, uh, in a way, both what we call post-mortems, because when, uh, the photography came into existence, it was a way for people to capture the likeness of their, their loved ones who had departed, and now they're, they're pretty avidly collected. <coughs> um, so the one on the left is of a painting or drawing by a man named W. H. Boynton. Could be a woman, actually, I don't know. And on the writing on the back says, Little Johnny Pasco died when he was eight years old. So this is this is a copy photograph of this drawing or painting, and it's based on the cabinet card mount. And there's no indication of the photographer, so it's very likely to be a traveling, traveling photographer. The one on the right has no no uh, identifying words about the photographer. Uh, or the subject, but it's a baby who's died. And um, so that's another traveling photographer, likely the niche. So the next group, one of my favorites. Um, so one thing that one learns in life is that young people like to have fun and joke around. I can't think of too many more enticing opportunities to do so than when the traveling photographer visits town. These three cabinet cards seem to express this. Young men gather to create visual arrangements that reflect joyful and playful moods. The paper amounts of these three cabinet cards suggest being around 1890 to 95. So on the left, you've got uh, four people, three of whom are Males, younger males. Two guys have top hats and aprons on, and the guy that has an apron. There's a woman in the back. She might be the, the owner of the restaurant or the cook, but they're just enjoying having their photo taken, which they'll share with their friends. Then the one in the middle, uh, these three young gentlemen appear to be dressed for the real cold. A flawed piece of the paper that suggests news reporting. No idea what the message is, but they use the photo to convey their message to what to whomever is their audience. The third photograph 
goofy corded men showing their fun, nonsensical sides to the camera, presumably so other others may be amused and entertained. The rug on the floor suggests temporary staging for this scene. The man on the top right appears to be older, perhaps the father or the boss. So now we have two more cabinet cards. So the one on the left, one of my very, very favorites, and it's a dancing couple in wooden shoes by a traveling photographer, B. James. Whereas in this case, we got the tip off that he was, he was a traveling photographer. He called his uh, operation the Palace Car. And you can see it's probably a bus car and on the railroad. And it's probably in the northern US, probably. They're probably Dutch or German. And uh, it's probably the, the Dakotas or the Wisconsin area. I love that photograph. How long would that have taken to expose? Mm -hmm. I mean, for, for uplifting for this little blurry? Uh, well, one reason they didn't smile is because these photos were, took a while. And this is probably 1870s, so it probably took a while, but we captured this pretty damn well. That's a part of my English. Uh, and they, they obviously like each other. I really love this order. She had the baby bandana on, and they're obviously dressed for the cold. And they have the wooden shoes on. And then the, uh, the cabinet card next to it are a couple of baseball players. And um, so there's no, again, no, there's no uh, photographer's imprint, for, and they're outdoors. So it's a couple of ball players and probably a tiny, a tiny photographer. I think it is anyway. So that's that. So we're getting near the end here. So this is. Um, so John Silvis, John B. Silvis, was born in 1830 in Lock Haven, Pennsylvania. He traveled overland to California in the spring of 1849 to mine for gold. After many unsuccessful attempts at establishing himself as a miner, Silvis learned the graph of photography in 1859 and formed a partnership with Charles Card. Uh, in my last compilation of Western photographers, uh, I, there's a little essay on uh, on Carter by one of his rel relatives. One of his, yeah. Anyway, um, Silvis left, and Carter kept the the uh, thing going in Salt Lake City. Kept his studio going in Salt Lake City, whereas Silvis had this car made for the Union Pacific Railroad, and so he would ride the tracks all over northern. Um, U.S. taking photographs of you, and he would hire himself out as a portrait photographer. So this is these are just uh, these are customers of his. A couple who got the photographs taken, but this is the back of the uh, Kirkby and they're uh, at the traveling uh, railroad photo wagon. So next we have so these are some. Examples of newspaper ads uh, in papers advertising the services of Leland Stanford Hazeltine, who was, who was uh, M. M. Hazeltine's son. I want to find out what the relationship was between Leland, Leland Stanford, Governor Stanford, and Hazeltine. And so that's a topic I'm interested in. But anyway, he ended up in, he was up in Idaho, I think, when he did this. Uh, he also like, was in Montana a lot, and he ended up down in Mendocino, which is where he, he was a boy. Uh, and he was like, he took a lot of photographs of the shipping down there. So this is a different kind of wagon. It's also a photographer's wagon, but as you can see, it's not big enough to 
sit people and take their photographs, but you could carry around all the equipment and the chemicals and so forth that you would need to get their uh, get the glass negatives and take the, take their pictures. So that's what this particular image is of a uh, of a uh, photographer in his wagon. So the next one is where we're traveling photo parlor, he calls it. This is uh, Bryant's traveling photo parlor. So I think that was used to have to shoot the photographs, but I don't really see a skylight there, but you might be able to see it at the angle. Uh, but there's no location identified, but uh, it's a great, uh, great signage on the wagon. Question. Pardon me? Question over here. In these photo wagons, were, what typically would, I mean, were they partitioned off with part of the dark room and part the studio for sitting? I, I think all kinds of different ways. And, uh, yeah, I think uh, that, uh, yeah, a really well appointed one, a really well designed one would have, definitely have that uh, kind of arrangement. You know, the more efficient they can make it, the better they can do their business. But I'm sure there's all kinds of permutations, depending on who the photographer was, how good they were with the saw and the hammer, and <laughs> their brother, and so forth. You, know. well, you have one, right, you said? I do have one. So what's yours like inside? <laughs> well, I don't have one. I have one. I have photographs of it. Oh. Really? Yeah. Um. Like the one I showed earlier, it's actually in the uh, case back here, so you can look at it. Um, so anyway, so this is... Uh, Probably in the Pacific Northwest. Whoop, the next one. All right, there. Somebody just sent this to me out of the blue. It's really neat, you know. It's uh, maybe a little later, maybe a eighteen nineties. But obviously, the family travels around in this thing, and they unload and set up, and they get customers and take their pictures. So this is an example of traveling photographer's wedding and his wife and child, and he's probably taking the pictures. I think the headquarters, of course, yeah, duh. <laughs> so this is, um, at the end of the talk, I love this, this is a uh, carte visite, and uh, from a photograph car, and they, this guy is Decca St. Nick, and uh, so anyway, that's cool. And then the other one is, uh, I'm Oregon, so I kind of have a lot of Oregon stuff. So, this is the cottage uh, car, and they're taking a picture of the uh, band here, so it's kind of cool. So that's it. <laughs>
But uh, back in the 1860s and 70s, 80s, these are all public domain. So you got it. Got the picture? You can just make copies. So what's the oldest picture you have? That I have now? Um, well, a daguerreotype is 1850s. I, I've had older daguerreotypes. A daguerreotype was, was announced in January of 1839. So in America, uh, it was George, uh, it was uh, Samuel B. F. B. Morse who went back to Paris when this announcement was made. And he brought an apparatus, a daguerreotype apparatus, with him home to the U.S. and he taught people on the East Coast, how to make daguerreotypes. So that was the beginning of daguerreotypes and photography in America. The Americans are very uh, resourceful and, you know, they want to, like, do the, do the do good deed, you know, and they, they made some beautiful, beautiful work back in those days. So you can see this one back here and get a chance. It's a really beautiful thing. I was, uh, I've seen so many the time. <laughs> What light did they use? You said 1860, 1870. How they didn't have electricity, so got the sun. But they were in, they were in this way then. That's where they have the skylight. Wow. Yeah, I know. I remember. I do show And people had to stay very still. Is that correct? See here. Yeah. The skylight. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, they had to say very skilled, yeah. still. And here, whoop. See the skylight up here? So was that a portion of the roof that opened up? And then you have, in the tent, they have the light in through here and here. That light was very important. I was just going to make a comment. Um, I studied photography, I have a degree in photojournalism. And I, I really, I, to me, I don't think that they just only photographed in their wagon. I'm sure right. they probably did on site, people's homes, you know, out in nature. So right. they weren't restricted just to the wagon. Um, but that was their means of getting around. And if they could use the wagon to take a photograph. And I see here, this is bike, uh, probably yeah. in an outbuilding, a farm or somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And like... I mentioned um, uh, well, we so, so this has the photographer's uh, information on the side, but they obviously didn't take photographs in it. Right. They would set up their equipment, and their, you know, wherever they could, you know, bamboozle the customer and let them <laughs> use their yeah. facility. Were there, um, when did daguerreotypes and tinotypes go out of fashion? Good question. So daguerreotypes, as I said, started in 1839. Actually, the first photograph was 1826. Daguerre's partner, a uh, guy named Neeps, uh, made that uh, you know, on a pewter. But anyway, daguerreotypes started in 1839. And they just got really popular really fast and um, <laughs> spread around, and a lot of them were made. But when the um, Frederick Archer in 1851 developed uh, the glass uh, native, and so the glass, and so the photograph on glass is called ambrotype. It was also kept in a uh, uh, So anyway, with the uh, uh, technological advances with glass, it made much sharper uh, photographs. Well, it didn't make sharper photographs. These are pretty amazing photographs, these daguerreotypes. But they don't reflect like the mirror, because they're, they're like mirrors. So, you know, there I am, but I want the photograph. But, so that's it kind of, the ambrotypes kind of pushed the daguerreotypes out by, I'd say, the uh, mid-50s or the late-50s, certainly. In England, they made them for a long time in, uh, like, uh, uh, as uh, tourist uh, things. But they made them in the 1860s and 70s. 
the amber tage. But anyway, so then tin tage came in right at the end of uh, the 1850s. And the Civil War, I mean, tin tage take off as they did part of the disease. Because they were smaller, people could afford them, and the Civil War, they wanted a picture of their brother or their father or their neighbor or whatever. So that was a big deal. And uh, so that really spread the uh, photography practice out there in the world. Were there many women photographers? That's a good topic. Um, there were some great women to photographer, but of course they were, you know, they were always my husband, you know, but there's some good ones out there. Yeah, there's some studies on women photographers, some good studies. Uh, Margaret Cameron Mitchell? Say again? Do you have any Margaret Cameron Mitchell photographs? Cameron? Margaret? Um, I don't. Because she was an early photographer. In England? Yes. Right. And yeah, she did large format stuff, and, uh, and she, her, her photographs are very valuable. Um, but I don't have any. Now, one more question. When Edward Mybridge was doing the study for Stanford on motion, Right. And then later on, they developed the film, the Kodak process. What year was that? Uh, my my bridge's work was uh, with the Stanford was in the early 1870s. And then later on, he, he went to a... Um, well, then he went back to Pennsylvania yeah, and, and worked for the University of Pennsylvania. Yeah. And then during his time, the transition to the last film, what year was that? My bridge was always working with glass, uh, negatives. What will you process? He never went to film. Uh, I don't think so. No, film didn't come in until like 18, late 80s, early 90s. And so by the turn of the century, film was taking over. But <clears throat> there's still some specialists that do it, even now, that do the, uh, um, do the old processes. I have a book, a book called The History of the Woodbury Type which I published for a guy down in L.A., he's Barrett Oliver, and uh, he makes Woodbury types, and he can do all the processes. So he, he can make amber types, or uh, wet collodion negatives, and prints, and so forth. Are the chemicals dangerous? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a few exploding wagons? Yeah, well, fires. And people would die of mercury poisoning. They need mercury to develop <coughs> some of these uh, processes. And if they smell too much mercury, then they either go crazy or they die. Good question. Did photographers have a short life expectancy because of that? <laughs> I think they did, actually. I think they did. How prolific were photographers on the East Coast? What's that? How prolific were traveling photographers on the East Coast? I didn't catch it. The East Coast. The East Coast. Yeah, what about the East Coast? How, probably, how many more? <laughs> well, I, all these pictures you're showing are, uh, looks like, all out in the West. Well, I'm a Western guy, you know, so. In the East. <laughs> so, pretend you're from the East. Were they prolific there? Oh, yeah. As much as the West? I feel like I can't understand what you're saying. Were they more pro prolific than the West? They probably had no, a they're all, skills. they're all, you know, it's a, as the time went on and uh, uh, more and more people gathered in town, became more urbanized, and the traveling photographers were less, and were less and less needed to go out and get uh, photographs. So uh, they developed elaborate studios in uh, all big towns, you know, like uh, uh, in C Cincinnati is a black photographer that's very popular, who uh, took a lot of great photo photographs back in the uh, in the, the, the Garotype era, and then he went on from there, and he ended up in Montana, and then finally Seattle. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it all evolved along the same lines. They were in communication. There were magazines being printed that a lot of them took, and there were examples of people like Peter Britt up in Jacksonville, Oregon. He was published in uh, the uh, magazines back in the, those days, and they all kind of kept pace with the new developments. 
and some were really into it. You know, they would love, they made, they loved the new techniques, and they would get into it. And they would buy the latest chemical for the uh, learn the new techniques and so forth. So anyway, they didn't all go for the new stuff. I have a right. lot of collection of a photographer by the name of Moore from Nevada City. Yeah. He apparently never gave up the glass plate. Because <laughs> yeah. I've got pictures of women in 1920s and 30s clothes on glass plate. Sure. Moore doesn't get forever. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Some people don't like to change. Well, it's like people that didn't want a computer. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, those in Ansel Adams was using glass plates and some of the Yosemite stuff, too. Okay. Yeah. So how many folks think in about 20, 100 years, we'll be talking about how we transition from film to okay. digital cameras <laughs> in about 50 years? Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.